occurred. That moved in those days of preparation before the birth of our Lord. It's the same spirit that moves within us in the, in the sanctuary as we pray in anticipation of the celebration of that birth and of your coming again. And dear God, we pray as we uh, tune our hearts to you, that you will take the words of this mouth and the meditations of this heart and make them acceptable in your sight. For you are a rock, you are a Lord, and you are a Redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, before I get more into God's Word now, I, I need to make a confession. Now, I'm not making the confession to bring attention to me. Uh, I, I'm just making a confession so you can relate with me, but also relate it to you. Does that make sense? All right. So don't think about me thinking uh, more about myself because I'm thinking about myself all the time anyway. So, <laughs> so I'm making a confession. So often the preacher does not apply the same guidance we preach. Consistently I counsel individuals and couples and families and leaders of the church on the effects of accumulated stress and unresolved strain that affects them personally, relationally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So what we know that anything that departs, that varies from the normal routines of daily living is life stress. Don't any of you have been stressed this week? Yeah. And if we let it compress, it either explodes or implodes. And the results aren't always pretty. Uh, throughout the week, uh, each week I hear people's stories on how they're overwrought, how they're overwhelmed, and how they're stressed out. Uh, anyone have a story like that to share today? Right. At any rate, last Sunday as I was completing the, my last message of the day, I, I just kind of ran out of steam. I was going through the motions, but I felt like I was washed out, spent, and as if I was going full speed and I ran out of gas. Anybody ever had that experience? We're going... Okay, I see a few people uh, can know what that sense is. And I was left to coast across the finish line. I apparently neglected my own admonition that I cancel others, thinking, like most of you, that I could just push through it like I've done many times before. You know, the business and the activity at the church is at full speed, with meetings and decisions being made, and We've stepped into new territory, budgets are developed, pledge campaigns, weddings, fundraising, dinners and markets, fall festivals, funerals, uh, uh, baptisms, courts of honor, meetings, meetings and more meetings and meetings about having other meetings. All good and Christ is being glorified. Lives are being touched and our people are giving out their lives to serve others. Uh, and this is remarkable. God bless you. On a personal side, many appointments between being kept between Waller Reed and the VA, determining uh, and narrowing down sources of pain resultant of uh, many years of military service, trying to squeeze those all in between all the other obligations, running back and forth to Hagerstown to hopefully prep to sell a house, and then there's the concentration on extended birthdays in October and November. Do you all have like those months where everybody has a birthday? <laughs> oh, I think I forgot one. <laughs> Giving Sarah away for a week, providing support for her parents. Sarah's transitioning to a new vocational field, which she just started this last week. Uh, death of extended family member, uh, major health procedures for one of our daughters, and then there's Thanksgiving, peanut brittle making, and on and on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing earth-shattering, nothing uncommon from what anyone else goes through. All the same, I wasn't following my own guidance on decompressing from the strain along the way. I kept my daily spiritual and physical regimen, which I count on to sustain me through each day, but often times when the daily routines or daily regimens don't prove sufficient when that life stress meter is paid. And that's my confession. In the Bible, you, you hear about it in James, he says that we should confess our sins with each other and pray for each other. And so I'm <coughs> confessing. With that, I must ask your forgiveness for giving you spiritual guidance in your life while not taking the same guidance myself. Uh, 
So I must thank you for your patience with me, even when I'm spent, and I've distanced myself from my resupply and my tank is empty. Yeah, ask him, you know, one of her anxieties on a road trip is to run out of gas. And when I'm driving and that gauge is hitting towards the empty mark, he has a little bit of anxiety. I'm kind of fine with it because I want to get the most out of a tank of gas. <laughs> And I have, and similarly, uh, I have no problems pressing the limit, getting the most out of my tank. So she has a bit of anxiety and becomes my limiter, uh, whereas I would keep going even if I was running on fumes, and often do. Needless to say, when I have an empty tank, I'm not much good to me, I'm not much good to my family, or I'm not much good to you or anyone else. When I do, I have to say I'm sorry. I'm not bringing attention to me. I'm just modeling for you what we all need to be doing with each other, aren't I? Well, you might be thinking, well, thank you, Pastor, for sharing, but what does it have to do with Sunday's Advent emphasis on hope? Knowing that hope is faith and confident anticipation, where does my insignificant story fit into with the message that the Bible speaks to you and me today? So bear with me, please, it does. If you look into the, in your Bibles, into 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, you see the author, despite the adversities he faced in the past and will face in the future, he has not lost his hope. He tells the church this, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you, now that you belong to Jesus Christ. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all your knowledge. And this confirms that what I had told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need to, as you eagerly wait the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame, that you will be free from all blame, blame that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returned. Now does the author, which happens to be the Apostle Paul, sound like he's lost hope? He expresses his appreciation for them, the gifts God has given him, his admiration that they are sold out totally for Jesus. He praises them for their eloquence and their knowledge, confirming what he's known all along that they possess an authentic, authentic sincerity in the life of Christ. And because of this, God gave them every spiritual gift at his disposal to prepare for the anticipation of Christ's return and how Christ in them will keep them strong to the very end so that they may be free and blameless when they ultimately meet their Lord and King. Now mind you, this was written on Paul's third and his last missionary journey. How many journeys did he have? Three. He put in thousands of miles on each of these journeys. And, and he was aware that this was going to be his last. And now, by the way, during his second missionary journey, he spent about he spent a good many years in Corinth, at least three years, establishing the community of believers, getting to know them and developing them as disciples for Jesus Christ. Yet that didn't mean it was without stress. It didn't mean it was without strain or difficult. It didn't mean that he, he didn't run into a number of conflicts with the locals that actually put his life in jeopardy. And throughout his journeys, Paul experienced imprisonments, beatings, mob uprisings, It was left for dead on more than one occasion. And whether scarred or bruised, Paul never abandoned the hope of the gospel he preached. And as he writes this letter to them, he is writing from Asia, uh, the Asia Minor Metropolis of Ephesus. And he's heard some disturbing things about the behavior of some in the church. There was disorder, there was sexual immorality, there was doctrinal misunderstandings and conflicts. It kind of sounds like what we hear going on today, doesn't it? Pretty much anything that could afflict the church they were experiencing. And this letter was in part a reminder of the confident hope they had before them, which is found in the introduction to the letter. And then it led on to admonishing them for forgetting the importance of their core values 
and who is the one that holds their life, their faith life together. Now he was planning to visit with them again before he concluded his third journey, and he did so for three months. But he also wanted to make sure they hadn't lost focus, and they had remembered that, and we see this in verse 8, that Jesus himself will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be free so that you'll be free from all blame. I'm going to say it again, that you'll be free from all blame. You'll be free from all blame on the day our Lord Jesus Christ returns. In the end, no matter how many times you are overcome by life events, stressed out or spent, run out of gas or empty or overwhelmed or depleted, when you rely on the strength of God within you, you will be blameless. You will be blameless. You will be blameless on the day Christ returns. In other words, Jesus, when I meet with him and see him eye to eye and face to face, he's not going to say to me, Clark, you really messed up. How could you have done that? Why did you think you could get away with it? Because he knows that despite my best intent and my best attempts, my human frailty will fail me. But because my faith, trust, and confident anticipation of what God can do in and through me, Christ will never fail me. And I need not fear blame. Did you get that? I need not fear blame. Can you say that with me? I need not fear blame. You see, each week we hear how someone else has blown it. Because people we've held in some degree of admiration and respect, sometimes we wake up to them in the morning before we go to work, and, and in the court of media and public opinion, they get no second chance, uh, no opportunity for redemption, no, uh, no break to make things right. They are to blame for the suffering, pain, and loss others have experienced because of them. They've lost favor, any esteem, or admiration. No matter how much good or value they've done in their past, the harm that they did outweighs anything and everything virtuous they ever accomplished. This no mistakes, this zero tolerance mindset condemns them to a life of blame, shame, and humiliation without due process or their day in court. But hear me, hear me clearly. I'm not making excuses for them or diminishing by any means the pain, suffering, and agony of their victims. My point is this. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, period. We've all messed up. And we've all offended and disappointed God. Yet we can still possess that confident, expectant hope that when that time comes and we all stand before our righteous Redeemer because of what he did for us to remedy our sin problem, we won't be held to blame. How many have blamed a spouse for why you weren't happy? Or your kids, or your parents, (laughs) or your or your, perhaps your boss, or your work, or your commute, or, I mean, there's, there's, all, yeah, there's always someone to blame for why you're stressed and strained and uh, out of sorts and overcommitted, and um, there's always someone else to blame for our debt, isn't it? <laughs> We're in the blame game. But here, our confident hope says, when we see our Lord and Savior, When we look at him eye to eye and face to face, he will not hold us to blame. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the good news of this season. And that that goes for me. When I let my tank run out of gas, and it goes for you when you allow life to overwhelm you, and it goes for those in power and influence who broke trust and injured and wounded others by their offenses. This is not Clark Carr speaking. This is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ telling it like it is. Jesus embraced this in Mark 13, being fully aware of the torment, the trauma, the tragedy that awaited him. Jesus, in conversation with his disciples, 
told them that it would get worse before it would get better. He said, at the time, at that time after the anguish of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will give no light and the stars will fall from the skies and the powers and the heavens will be shaken. And yet when, uh, yet when it appears that all have given up hope, he will return. It says, the, then everyone will see the Son of Man coming out of the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his, out his angels to gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven, and then explain to them a number of things. There will always be indicators to remind you that no matter how bad or good things may seem to be, you can be confident and you can count on me coming again. In fact, when all is said and done, and what we know and as reality is no more, Jesus' words will, are permanent, they are indelible, and they never disappear, they never lose their meaning, and they never fail in their impact. They said, don't try and... <laughs> it's funny, when I have, have people that... They, I shouldn't say it's funny, but it, you, there's a lot of people out there that, that try to anticipate when Christ is going to come again. They try and look at all the signs and all, everything, try to put it together. And Jesus says, it's okay, because there's indicators out there that tell you that my, my time is coming, but don't try and predict it. I don't even know, only my Father in Heaven knows, but you know, when I find people that are trying to figure out when Christ is going to come again, it's kind of, we can't even figure out how the tax bill, the new tax bill is going to affect us. How are we going to figure out, you know, how are we going to figure out that, you know? It's not worth conjecturing. It's not your, worth your time or energy. And instead, he, he left us with these words. Be ready, stay alert. It's better to be, be prepared with a full tank than running on empty. Jesus modeled for us that stress, pain, suffering, grief, hardship, and even abuse we've experienced don't have to define us. He endured them, and they definitely didn't define him. The author of Hebrews put it this way in chapter 12, verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes upon Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and now he's seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. And what do we get out of this? The stuff that life throws at us, the junk we accumulate in life, the messes we get ourselves into, and the stresses we embattle, are all overcome when we keep our eyes upon Jesus. There's a song that goes like that. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Look fully in his wonderful face. Then the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Can you sing that with me? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. Then the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus didn't minimize the stresses you encounter or the pain you suffer. He just said those things don't define you and assures you of a better end because he's coming again. And when you're out of steam, when you're spent, when you're overwhelmed, and the tank is running <coughs> on fumes, it just means all the more your need to turn and rely on the sure and confident hope. The very one who saved humanity from itself will save you from yourself too. Uh, you know, in James 5.16, it says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I just modeled that for you. You know, the more we confess with each other, you know, there's it's, there's something that between Jeff and I, you know, Jeff, you did something the other day, and I and I'm just holding this, and it's just, you know, you know, if there's anything in between us, I need to confess that. That clears the way for our relationship to grow stronger, doesn't it? And Bible says when we confess our sins, or confess our disagreements, or our frustrations with each other, and we pray for each other, healing will follow. Do you know what causes most of our ailments and our maladies? 
stress. <laughs> okay. And when we confess, God distresses. Can I hear him? Amen, please. So <laughs> confess and pray, and God can make right those that are out of balance. Those things that cause you distress and making you ill so healing may follow. And that great power will be at your disposal with wonderful results to share. And this, my friends, is the hope of Advent. Happy first Advent. And I'm looking forward to the next ones to come. God bless you. And now, prepare your heart as we come and share in our Lord's communion. Okay? There, there you are, right there. Lord. Looking right over you. Sure. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and pure thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, <coughs> whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send away empty. Your son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself to, in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, in the, it was as if the whole world had turned its back on him, Jesus took the bread, he lifted it to heaven, and he gave thanks. He broke the bread, and he passed it amongst his disciples, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat, eat, <coughs> eat in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper was over, he then took the cup and he lifted it to heaven and he gave thanks. He passed it amongst each of his disciples saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, the new promise of my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And as often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me knowing that I blame you no more. You are no longer to blame. I've taken care of you. All the same. And so, O oh Lord, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim this mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, risen, and Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, on these gifts. And all of us gathered here, on these gifts and bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, 
that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and by your spirit. Make us one. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forever. And Lord, we give you thanks. Give you thanks for the freedom you've given us, freedom from our sins, freedom from ourselves, and freedom to serve you and to love others with your very love within us. And now, O oh Lord, as you've loved us and as you taught us, so now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amy, why don't you take uh, Aiden? Aiden? Ask you to come forward. I will. Uh, we will have the gluten-free as well as the regular uh, wafers here for you to choose.
please rise up and join us for some music.
Children say 